What was the thing that made you question your beliefs? What was the major challenge that you had to face? You were the only uh, hijabi bus driver at that time, right? My friend called me for the janaza. I'd never been to a funeral before and I never saw a dead person before. I got attacked, beaten up pretty badly. They stole my car that I had at the time. They stole money from me. God, I don't know whether you're there or you're not there, but if you are there, I was blown away. Whoa. I want to first ask you, who is Ustada Amina Blake? Can you tell us briefly about your life? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Okay, so my background is um, I was born uh, to a 17-year-old girl in uh, Chester, which is near Liverpool. She decided to uh, adopt me out, so I was adopted um, as a child by a family who lived in Sheffield. So I came to Sheffield and that's where I lived and live now. So I'm adopted child, only child. Um, my father was a professor of English language and linguistics at Sheffield University. And uh, my mother was a poet and artist. And unfortunately, both of them have passed away now. Um, and so, yeah, I, you know, I had quite an interesting upbringing, very academic. Uh, but I was a rebellious child, a tomboy, actually. I loved horses and cars and lorries and buses and not dresses or anything girly at all. How was your life in regards to faith? What were you believing in? My faith, um, I was brought up as a Christian, which was actually at the request of, you know, the, my birth mother. And I was sent to Sunday school, which I loved. But I always, I, I questioned Christianity really from quite a young age, from being a teenager. But I loved the stories of the prophets and the stories in the Bible. We used to sit in Sunday school and the uh, teacher would really nicely teach us the stories of, um, you know, um, Isa alayhi salam and Moses and Ibrahim alayhi salam. And I really used to enjoy that as a child. Um, but by the time I was, I guess, maybe 15 or 16, I'd asked questions of the Bible and didn't get convincing answers about its authenticity um, and its kind of uh, foundation. So at that point, really, I believed in God, but I wouldn't have identified myself as any particular religion. Uh, what was the thing that made you question your beliefs? And uh, when was it? When I found that there were contradictions in the Bible, I found out from the, actually the vicar, he was very good and he was very honest. And I said, well, you know, what's this, you know, why should I believe in God? Why should I believe in the Bible? And he said, well, you have to believe in your heart. And I said, well, what's the proof? So. I asked him these questions, you know, well, you've got to believe in your heart, it's a feeling. And I thought, well, I believe in God, but actually, if this text, if this book can't uh, prove that it's the word of God and it has contradictions in it, and actually, if it was God's word, in my opinion, it would be perfect with no contradictions, then actually, I don't think I can follow that. What were your thoughts about Islam? Well, I'd always mixed with Muslims, um, even as a, as a child, my father, as a professor, he had students who were Muslim. And so my first contact with Islam actually was through a girl that I used to go nightclubbing with as a, as a 17, 18 year old. I was about, probably about 18. And at the time I left home at 16. I mean, this is how rebellious I was. Got myself a council flat, a council property this tiny little property. What happened is I mixed with the wrong people and some not very nice people sent some people to, to basically attack me in my apartment where I was living. Um, so I got attacked and um, beaten up pretty badly. Uh, they stole my car that I had at the time. They stole money from me. Um, and actually, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, places people in the situation where they are forced to do something. Because otherwise your life is never going to change. There has to be this disruption in your life in order to have change. And so as a result of this attack, I was too scared to go back to my flat. And the place I went to and was my Muslim friend who I was nightclubbing with. And she said, no, come and stay at my house. So I went to stay at her house and she only had one book in the house and this book is Al-Qur'an. And the Qur'an, it just was the English and Arabic version. And so I said to her, because I was bored, teenager, I was bored and I was like, oh, look at this 
book. Can I have a look? So she said, okay, go have a wash, wash your hands. And <laughs> you can open the book and have a look. So I opened the book and I saw, subhanAllah, I saw the stories that I'd saw, seen and loved in my Sunday school days. And I was like, wow, that's familiar. Because at school, and this is really important to note, in the West at school, you're taught Islam, Christianity as two completely separate things. There's no uh, autonomy or, or comparison between God and Allah. Allah is for Muslims and God is for Christians. It's like they're different gods, different religions. And um, that's what I had understood. And so I started asking questions to my friend. What's this book? Why is it so similar to Christianity? So she introduced me to her neighbor and he actually said, give me some time and I'm gonna bring you some answers. But he must've gone to his sheikh. And the sheikh obviously gave him some verses, some ayat, which were relevant to what I was asking, which was scientific proof. I said, wow, that's amazing. And then he added something that was key, was that, oh, by the way, this was revealed to an illiterate guy in a desert like 1400 years ago. I was blown away. I was like, Whoa. So this brother, he gave us this video called Rasala, the message. And it was two and a half or three hours long, I've forgotten. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made me come into the room where the TV was in the corner at the key moment near the end of the film when Bilal radiallahu an, he's on the Kaaba and he makes the Adhan. And I heard the Adhan and it was like my whole being was immersed in a warm, fizzy feeling, what, like completely enveloped. Of course, this is Halawat al-Iman. So I had this halawat al-Iman. I remember turning to my friend and I said to her, I want to become Muslim and I want to do this like now. How did your family and uh, close circle uh, react to this? Okay, well, because it was pre 9-11, I think it was a lot easier because there was still this element of multiculturalism in, in, in British society anyway. And so when I became Muslim, um, I remember I went and told my parents in a very clumsy way, and I think that's what lots of new Muslims do. My father, he thought it was a phase that I was going through. Um, and my mum, she was concerned about, about me being oppressed, you know, not being able to work and all these kinds. So they did have concerns, but not the same type of concerns as people who, you know, have children who become Muslim or family members now. But your father didn't take you seriously? Then. He didn't take me seriously at first. But once he realised how Islam grounded me and made me much more sensible, much less headstrong, I was much, uh, made me a much kinder person, made me a much nicer person, alhamdulillah. Um, and so I think that they realised that Islam was actually very good for me and wasn't detrimental. What was the major challenge that you had to face after you became Muslim? One of the main challenges, I suppose, was gaining knowledge. I really, really wanted to gain knowledge. And I wanted to, I was so excited about being Muslim. And really, when I became Muslim, all I really knew was La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And that's pretty much it. And, but I thought I was like the greatest da'ya on the earth because I had this new thing. And I thought, I have to gain knowledge. If I want to give this beautiful message of Islam, I have to gain knowledge. And that was the next part of my journey. From whom you could get this knowledge? And what did your quest turn out to be? Okay, well, my quest was very much a spiritual quest, but I didn't realize that at the time. Now, again, we go back to the idea of, of strangeness, of loneliness. And many Muslims and new Muslims will talk about this feeling and this experience of no loneliness in quite a negative manner. And it's only actually been in the last few years that I realized that it's something that is choreographed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's very, very important to experience this. Why? Because when you become Muslim or when you start embracing your spirituality, you get to the point that, first of all, you are asking other people to help you. So I would ask my friends, teach me to pray. I was desperate to pray. 
I would ask and ask, and I got really frustrated when nobody knew how to teach me how to pray. Everyone was saying, inshallah, and it, nothing happened. And this carried on until a point in time when I realized that actually I shouldn't be asking people. That's not the first port of call. The first port of call is asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there was this guy in the phone box, this really tall, built, mixed race guy. He was looking at me from the phone box. And all of a sudden he opens the phone box and he sticks his head out and he says, you Muslim? And he said, wait there. I was like, when somebody t like that size tells you to wait, you just wait. So I waited. He picked up the phone and dialed a number. And then the phone came out of the phone box the, with his hand, and he, um, he said, here, this is Sister Tracy, talk to her. And she, subhanAllah, became not just my mentor and my teacher, she also sowed the seeds for me becoming an ustada myself. She taught me how to pray, she taught me the arkan uh, al-Iman, she showed me the correct way to be Muslim, she taught me about the hijab. And actually, she was an answer to my du'a from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, subhanAllah, amazing. What about the Islamic practices like salah five times a day and fasting for a whole month? Were they difficult for you? My journey actually into the salah was an amazing one because, again, I was learning how to pray. I'd been given a small, Tracy gave me a small book to, to read from to learn how to pray. And I was on that process, but I wasn't praying yet. Now, at the same time, um, a, f a friend of mine's father um, fell off a ladder. He had a heart attack, and it's a Muslim family. He fell off this ladder, had a heart attack, and passed away. Allah yarhamu. When I used to go to this friend's house, he was the uncle who would come in, and he'd go to the kitchen, he'd make wudu, and he would pray in front of the gas fire that they had in the room. That's what I, I always knew that, you know, he was the one who, he was the guy who prayed. My friend called me for the janaza. I'd never been to a funeral before and I never saw a dead person before. So in Pakistani culture, it's very different. So what they do is they have the, the, the body in the, in, in the coffin, in the, uh, the room in the home and they, the, the face remains open until halas, they close it, ready for the uh, Salat al -Janeza. And so she said, look, come in and see, because my dad really thought a lot of you, come in and, and, and see him. I was really, really nervous. And she says, no, 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 come, it's fine, it's fine. And I looked into this coffin, and as I'm sitting here, wallah al-adheem, this brother was lying there and he was smiling. He had the most beautiful smile, and he had noor coming from his face. And at that moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded me and gave me the vision of this brother doing his salah. So I immediately connected. This smile is a result of this salah. From that time on, I didn't miss a salah. You were mentioning you were the only uh, hijabi bus driver at that time, right? Since I was a young child, I loved big vehicles and I wanted to, like I used to work on a farm and volunteer on a farm and tractors and things like that, I used to love them. Um, and so when I became old enough to drive, in the UK you have to be 21 to drive a bus. I was already Muslim and I was already hijabi, but I thought, well, why should a hijab stop me from driving a bus? Alhamdulillah, I, you know, I moved forward and then, uh, you know, went to this bus station, insisted that they give me the application form. You have two barriers to get through there. First of all, well, three. First of all, the fact that you're a woman and a very young woman. Secondly, you're a Muslim woman wearing a hijab, so you have to get through all that mess. But then, of course, you have to get through the barriers of the Muslim community, like the haram police, you know, come and say, oh, well, you know, you're a hijab and what are you doing? And you're mixing with men and you're all the, the rest of this stuff. Actually, the rest of the people on my group who were trainees were all men. And I was the only one who passed the test first time. How did you manage to keep your faith and what should be done to prevent the other people leaving Islam? There are several different things to consider here. Firstly, new Muslims need mentorship. They need one-on-one -on -one support in order to put them on a, a simple and correct path. You know, people presume that because 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you this um, halawat al-iman and this hidayah to become Muslim, then you automatically have a strong iman. And taqwa, you don't. It's like expecting a newborn baby to stand up and run a marathon. It's, it ain't going to happen. So you need that support. I think on the other level, it's very important to remember that being Muslim is a process. And throughout that process, we need to have structures in place whether it's uh, social structures or it's emotional structures or psychological structures, in order to help people to move forward. Do you think that Islamophobia is growing in the world nowadays and what should be done to you know, stop this from happening? Islamophobia is definitely growing in the world today. Media is a massive platform for this. We as an ummah must pull together you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and do not be divided amongst yourselves, because when you're divided, we, we're weak. We have to pull together, even just on this subject, and create wisdom. We have to have the ilm and the hikmah through the, through the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to be able to create a counter-narrative that is understandable by the world. Now, how we do that is up to us to decide. But what we cannot do is to sit and be silent because when you have silence, you have a, a, a space and space will always be filled by something. And currently it's filled by negativity. We are the representatives. So why don't we start representing Islam in, in the, the most beautiful way? Because it's a beautiful faith and many people are searching for this. I'm going to go to a story actually of the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because there was media then, right, as well. Media has been always there. It's, it's words. And when in, in the, uh, the time when the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered Mecca, the media was... He's going to kill us all. He's going to slaughter us all. It's going to be a bloodbath. You know, everyone was terrified, right, of these, these Muslims because they oppressed them, they'd been bad to them. But when the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered, uh, entered back into Mecca, he gathers the people together and he says, what do you expect from me? What do you expect from me? And he uses the words of the, in the Quran, of the, in Surah Yusuf, and he talks about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as being the most merciful of the merciful. And he destroys that narrative. Now, if we can give a positive narrative, then it doesn't matter what impression the media and politicians give, because that positivity is already inside people's hearts. What is the best way to call people to Islam, do you think? There are different ways of calling people to Islam, depending on where they are in their lives. When you live Islam, Amilus Salihat, you are the person who is trustworthy, your person who is the best of human beings. You are doing Islam rather than saying Islam. And if, when we look at the, um, the practice of the, not just the uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but Yusuf Alaihi Wasallam and all these prophets, the first stages are building this trust with the people. Because if you can't build trust with the people, if you can't be the best that you can be, why do you expect people to listen to you when you give them a message of truth if you've been not behaving appropriately in the first place? What impressed you the most about our Prophet Oh, that's a, that's a deep, deep, deep question. Everything is the answer. Everything. Every time I read something or learn something new about the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I love him more. But there's one particular thing that when I learned this thing, I just, I was crying, subhanAllah. And this is actually that there was a, there's a beautiful incident when the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is growing weak. And so it's close to the end. And he's been uh, walking with two of the companions. And he says, I miss my brothers. I miss my brothers. And his companions said, Ya Rasulullah, we're here with you. He said, no. He said, you are my companions. He said, my brothers are the ones who will believe in me, but they never met me. If you had a chance to speak to all the non-Muslims in the world, and you have only one minute, what would you like to say to them? What I would say is put prejudices to one side, open your heart and think about 
you know, peaceful heart, how you want your heart and your life to be peaceful. And this void, many people have a void, of a spiritual void filled by something positive. You know, I always say to people and like, you know, my non-Muslim friends, when they ask me, you know, if you seek the truth, if you open your heart and you put your prejudices to one side and you genuinely seek the truth and pray, God, I don't know whether you're there or you're not there, but if you are there, guide me to the truth and then see what happens.